For Zion must increase in beauty and in holiness. Her borders must be enlarged. Her stakes must be strengthened. Yea, verily I say unto you, Zion must arise and put on her beautiful garments. No longer might this church be thought of as a Utah church or as an American church, but the membership of the church is now distributed over the earth in 78 countries, teaching the gospel in 17 different languages at the present time. <laughs> Much of the drama for the story of the worldwide church in action in 1973 centers on moves by the First Presidency to make the gospel function with full effectiveness across culture, class, country. In a report released in August, the First Presidency indicated church membership abroad had increased 350% since 1960 and consisted of 100,000 in Mexico, 185,000 in Central and South America, 150,000 in Europe, 120,000 in the South Pacific, 70,000 in Canada, and 70,000 in Asia and Africa. By year's end, church membership totaled 3,321,556 organized into 630 states. The first stake in Korea was organized in Seoul on March 8th by Elder Spencer W. Kimball, President of the Council of the Twelve. In May, the Manila stake, first in the Philippines, was organized by Elder Ezra Taft Benson of the Council of the Twelve. Six new full-time missions were organized in 1973, bringing the number to 108. Four of the new missions were outside the United States the Japan Nagoya, Australia Northeast, Canada Maritime, and Thailand. In February, the first full-time agricultural missionaries were called outside of the United States. Agricultural missionaries are called to help farmers get better production out of the land and to teach modern farm methods to improve crop yield. The concern of the church for the temporal and spiritual welfare of its new members in developing countries was exemplified in 1973 in many important ways, one of which was the Health Services Missionary Program implemented in 1971. By the end of 1973, 100 health missionaries were at work in 22 countries, aiding local saints and other native peoples with their health and medical needs, and teaching them how to help themselves in caring for both body and spirit. The Translation Services Department worked throughout 1973 to help members in other lands grow in the gospel by providing materials printed in their own language. The department translated the standard works, curriculum materials, family home evening manuals, and missionary tools into 16 languages. Another dimension of the church's growing international stature was that seminaries were operating in all 50 states and in 45 countries, and that institutes of religion were operating in 46 states and 29 countries. Total enrollment, including the Indian seminary program, exceeded 240,000. The seminary home study program, established for the benefit of young Latter-day Saints isolated from their counterparts, expanded in 1973 to 45 countries with a total enrollment of over 35,000. Growth of the church in Europe was dramatically demonstrated when 14,000 saints from Germany, Spain, France, the Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, Austria, and Italy gathered in August in Munich's Great Olympic Hall for the Third Area General Conference of the Church. One of the challenges of this conference was how to translate the speeches into six languages. All speeches were given in German over the public address system 
and other languages were transmitted simultaneously into cordless headsets. All members of the First Presidency attended the conference, as well as 10 other general authorities and the Tabernacle Choir. We are all brothers and sisters in the Lord, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Lee opened the conference by addressing himself to the universal nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are neither English, nor German, nor French, nor Dutch, nor Spanish, nor Italian, but we were all one as baptized members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. General authorities and church leaders spoke. The saints also heard from their local leaders. Je me rappelle encore le jour où j'ai refusé d'offrir la prière. When the last song was sung, the last benediction offered, the conference was officially over. Yet the saints lingered, savoring the spirit of that hour. While in Germany, the Tabernacle Choir filmed a special for German television and were given a rare invitation to sing in the theater of the Passion Play at Oberammergau. In 1973 also saw the signing of the Paris Accords, the formal ending of U.S. involvement in Vietnam, and the return home of American prisoners of war, some of whom were Latter-day Saints. President Lee paid special tribute to these men at the General Priesthood Session of April Conference. We have Captain Larry Chesley. Is he somewhere where we can see him? Will you stand up? Major J. C. Hess, and Lieutenant Commander David J. Rollins. These three young men represent many of those boys who have gone through the fire of adversity. In the weeks that followed, as the men spoke of their experiences, it became clear that the gospel had been a sustaining source of strength during the long years of captivity. Other Latter-day Saint men and women serving with the military at posts worldwide heard a special message from President Lee in August over the Armed Forces Network. Also at the General Priesthood Session of the April Conference, speakers elaborated on the Priesthood-Oriented Mutual Improvement Association programs announced late in 1972. President Lee had called the decision to make these alterations potentially one of the most significant changes in the church in our lifetime. He explained their significance in this way. These announced Aaronic Priesthood and Melchizedek Priesthood, MIA, do not do away with the young men's and young men's, young women's mutual improvement associations of the past. What there is intended, as you see this unfolded is, that the programs will still go forward but with priesthood identity, the like of which they have not enjoyed before. Elder James E. Faust, assistant to the Twelve, spoke on the Melchizedek Priesthood MIA. We must begin by trying to reach the one. Every single individual. Presiding Bishop of the Church, Victor L. Brown, discussed the Aaronic Priesthood MIA. The MIA under this reorganization becomes part of the priesthood and is no longer an auxiliary. And there were some dramatic programs put on by various MIAs throughout the church this year. In July, 55,000 Latter-day Saints, one of the largest gatherings of Mormons in church history, witnessed the Southern California Area Dance Festival in Pasadena's Rose Bowl. 6,000 dancers representing 52 states performed on the huge field. Earlier in June, 3,000 dancers from 32 states had participated in the Northern California Reno Area Dance Festival held in Oakland, California. Sister Laverne Watts Parmley, general president of the primary, received a major honor late in the year. 
She was appointed to serve on the National Advisory Council of the Boy Scouts of America. Sister Parmley had become the second woman in the history of the council to so serve. At mid-year, a project was begun to microfilm all records and archival materials in the church historical department's archives. The microfilm was to be made available to the library patrons and also for filing in the granite mountain storage vaults. Florence Jacobson, former president of the Young Women's MIA, was called to be curator for the church. She will supervise gathering, cataloging, and preservation of pioneer relics and paintings owned by the church. It is the goal of the curator's department of the church to collect historical memorabilia, artifacts, documents, and other items of interest, which when placed in a museum will reconfirm that the gospel of Jesus Christ has indeed been restored. In April, the Welfare Services Department was created to bring the church's three welfare units into correlation. The General Church Welfare Program, Health Services Corporation, and LDS Social Services were placed in the new department. Welfare services responded in a range of meaningful ways in 1973 to help the poor and needy help themselves. More than 103,000 persons were assisted and gainful employment was found for over 16,000. The social services department has been aiding the church and its members in various social problems since 1969. As the larger American and world society experienced ever-increasing social and moral problems, the Social Services Department expanded its counseling and administrative services to give specific moral and spiritual guidance to members with special problems and, hopefully, to find better ways to combat those worldly influences. The church's commitment to education was exemplified in many ways in 1973. Elementary and secondary church schools outside of the United States were touching ever-growing numbers of young people. By the end of the year, these institutions enrolled 17,000 students in 50 countries. Marion G. Romney of the First Presidency dedicated the new Aloha Center, a student union facility at the Church College of Hawaii. Later, the college announced a $4 million program to expand the library and to build additional student housing. In March, BYU announced plans to double the size of its library, and Ricks College opened bids to expand its David O. McKay Library. Several months later, Ricks opened a new student health center. The 23,000-seat Marriott Activity Center at BYU the largest such facility on any campus in the United States was dedicated February 4th under the direction of President Harold B. Lee. J. Willard Marriott, business leader, was honored for his contribution toward its construction. Groundbreaking ceremonies for the J. Reuben Clark Law School building were held at BYU May 1st, and on August 27th, the law school proper was formally opened and the first class admitted. Dallin H. Oaks, BYU president, and President Marion G. Romney spoke. In the spring and fall, the church announced major building projects. At a press conference in April in New York City, President Lee disclosed plans to build a 36-story building in New York's Lincoln Square. The building was to provide facilities for religious, educational, and cultural activities of the church. Also in April, the First Presidency announced a major renovation and expansion program for the Polynesian Cultural Center at Laia, Hawaii. For a decade, the center had been a major missionary tool and tourist attraction in the Pacific. In September, the church unveiled a model of a pavilion to be built at the Spokane World Exposition in 1974. The pavilion was to resemble the gold plates from which the Prophet Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. 
it was to feature an exhibit entitled Ancient America Speaks. A new section was added to the Hawaii Temple Visitor Center at Laia to enable Japanese-speaking people to hear of the church in their own language. Another construction-related event included the dedication of five newly restored historic buildings erected in Nauvoo during the seven years the church was headquartered there. The church also gained greater national recognition in several other ways this year. In May, a 30-minute documentary about the church, produced by ABC, was shown on national television. A large portion of the program took place in a typical family home evening of an LDS family. NBC also aired a similar half-hour documentary as part of a special news report in November. Uh, There's just three basic things that... All... An outdoor summer drama was held in Manti, the Mormon Miracle Pageant. This production, which had begun in 1967 as a one-night stand, involved a production crew and cast of hundreds and was seen by over 10,000 people during its week-long run. That no matter what the suffering or tragedy of this life might bring, nothing is lost. The morning after my call came to be president of the church, as I knelt with my dear companion in prayer, my heart and soul seemed to reach out to the total membership of the church with a special kind of fellowship and love, which was like the opening of the windows of heaven to give me a brief feeling of belonging to the more than three million members of the church in all parts of the world. In late December, President Lee, feeling ill at ease, had entered Salt Lake LDS Hospital. On December 26th at 9 p.m., he died of lung and cardiac failure. He had served as the 11th president of the church for a year and a half. For the next two days, as his body lay in state in the church administration building, 15,000 men, women, and children paid their respects. Other expressions of respect and love arrived from members and non-members worldwide. Funeral services were held in the Salt Lake Tabernacle on Saturday, December 29th. Those who knew him best expressed their love. Harold B. Lee, man of loyalty. Loyalty to principle. Loyalty to country. Loyalty to family. Loyalty to God. The source of his greatness was his knowledge that he lived in the shadow of the Almighty. God was his partner and his guide. He wanted to be of service to his fellow men. And I am sure he believed, as the Lord had said, inasmuch as you have done it unto the, one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. A giant redwood has fallen. These words spoken by President Harold B. Lee himself at the funeral of a former state president seem very appropriate today. A giant redwood has fallen and left a great space in the forest. The giant of a man he was, a man endowed with a rare native intelligence, a giant whose shadow fell across the world, bringing under its influence the influence of the gospel millions of members and friends of the church a great giant who with inspiration made the experience the stories and the counsel of the scriptures find place in the hearts and minds of men the world over a giant who reached into the inner recesses of his listeners hearts to plant understanding vision direction and comfort a master teacher who, much like the Savior, took the ordinary experiences of today to teach the will of the Lord. Yes, among our generation has walked one of God's most noble, powerful, 
committed and foreordained giant, Redwoods, President Harold B. Lee. Father, it is uh, not unfitting that the heavens should weep, for we weep. The day after the funeral in the Salt Lake Temple, Spencer W. Kimball, who had been president of the Council of the Twelve, was ordained and set apart as president of the church by the Twelve, with Ezra Taft Benson serving his voice. President Kimball then set apart his two counselors, the same who had served President Lee, President N. Eldon Tanner, and President Marion G. Romney. On the last day of 1973, President Kimball held a press conference. We have the assurance that we are carrying forward the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of this church. We are but his earthly helpers. Some of the things that we are especially interested in have been carried forward by President Lee, our predecessor. And so we will in large measure carry forward in the same program which we have helped in a small way to make and uh, give it greater emphasis if we can, carry forward the work uh, as, as much as our talents and abilities will permit. Achievement, challenge, change on an ever enlarging international scale. This was the church in action, 1973.